that uh, my having met you would not end with this particular class itself. There will be probably others of you wandering in a little bit later, but it's also interesting to note at the end of a course those that are present versus those that were present at the beginning of the course. And I would think that in a course in metaphysics, and bending my arm backwards and slapping myself on the back, hopefully being presented in a correct manner and fashion, that uh, it would be growing and would be more people here at the end than the beginning. But again, that is never the case in what is called metaphysics or expanding consciousness. Let me say that I've got so much to share with you this evening, I almost don't know where to begin. I always use ponies and notes so that nothing is left out, not because I haven't taught this class before or not that I don't have the positives of information I want to get off of my mind so I can rest. But it's always still necessary to use these pony guides more or less to make sure that I don't leave out something. I'm sure that there will be some interaction between us at the end of tonight. We'll probably keep us here all night if we can stay here. Since we can't, I'd say pick your best shot and give it. And hopefully this would not be the end of this. Usually in a course that's extensive and having covered so much as this course has, there is a review course where we meet one more time to go over the entire thing. This will <coughs> being able to present more intelligently our questions, our answers, our interchanging and interfacing. But that's going to be kind of difficult to do because of the mileage that is uh, from where I stay as a home base and where you stay as a home base. I am hopefully um, positive, that's what you call really affirming it, that you will not lose sight and contact with each other. It is my hope that you will create a chapter of what is called the Meta Center here. Or if you don't choose to do that, that you would at least stay together in some kind of way significantly by keeping in touch. The kind of information, as I stated last week, that you've been exposed to, I didn't say learned, I said you've been exposed to, I didn't say accepted, I said be exposed to, is such that will generally put you in bad stead with your normal friends, relatives, uh, acquaintances, relations, and so on and so forth. Or if you begin to open your mouth and told the truth, they tell you to shut your mouth quickly, because they wouldn't want to hear that. So you've got to have somebody to talk to and to continue research. And I state that I'm pretty sure that the information you've been exposed to here, when you see the newspapers and the periodicals, when you see the so-called scandal sheets, and almost now, almost the new daily newspapers are becoming scandal sheets, you would begin to be able to tie in factually information that you've researched and found the truth with where others will only be skeptically or frighteningly looking at it and saying, what in the world is going on? You may say the same thing, but you'll know what is going on. And hopefully you'll make arrangements and provisions to begin to try to adapt to either this new world order or to stay afloat with the old world order. Based on last week and um, with the kind of things I'm affronted and confronted and associated with in Chicago and what we covered here, it gets kind of humorous to me because there are people who have finished the course many years ago that are now coming back around to our organization. When we met Tuesday, we had 15 people that came and dropped out of the clear blue sky, literally or figuratively, all that you said. But nevertheless, these were people who had taken classes with me way back in 71 and 70. And something is motivating them now to come back around. We have our spiritual circles that we have, and we try to help each other in our endeavors because of the wisdom we feel we have. And since we know we don't have it all, we're always out there with scouts trying to find what is the latest in a particular vein. We've covered here some 48 subjects believe it or not, and that's not counting your black history course, which many of you were in. And each of those subjects is different from the approach that we took, which means that there are 40 different things in life that many people, outside of those who already belong to so-called secret societies, are looking at one way that you won't. So I sincerely hope we will not waste that. There is a 10-week course that I have that the group offers 
its research because in many cases we would bring in those practitioners within our own group that are good at that particular thing and have them to teach that to you or to demonstrate to you how it's done. I don't know that uh, we can pull that off here. Again, we'd have to have a minimum to make it anyway worth the while of 20 people. I don't even know if we have 20 people who haven't finished this course. I really don't. Uh, as I say, um, if you are interested in that, kind of let me know by either voice, voice vote or hand vote before I leave tonight that you'd be interested in continuing uh, with this course. What is bad about that is that this particular course for any new people coming in would leave them pretty much shaken. It would give them information that they could do more harm than good to themselves with without having had the base that you have, so there's not too many people I can pull from to even get new numbers in. And of course usually goes again by monetary fashion for 155 bucks, and we did put it at one time for 250 bucks. But I'm saying again, when offered uh, as a concatenation of what you've already gone through, it would be 155 bucks for the 10 weeks. It would include uh, a look at hypnotism and self-hypnotism, quick ways to hypnotize and to gain mental control. We'll take a look at manipulating the electromagnetic field by crystals or by magnets that can be placed in various places that a person wouldn't even realize and they'd be affected by you by that, which may come in better than sometimes a gun would do if you know how to manipulate and use that. It would take a look at the energy uh, articulation where you begin to look at that light and accumulate things, how you can begin to see how you could affect objects at distances by using that and how some animals will respond to it once you get their frequency and it teaches you how to get frequencies. It shows you again the various arts of massage and touch, uh, nerves, central nerves of the body where by touching you can paralyze a person or by uh, putting light rays on it you can confuse a person. Also again how you can use that to begin to heal. Anything that has good has a bad quality for it. A series there is of teaching you crystals and the usage of crystals, the proper hopefully use of the crystals, and combining <coughs> crystals with magnets to begin to cure water when you can't get to things that can purify water to begin to help to heal when you won't be able to get hold of medicines and things like this, especially if you can put the person first into at least a alpha stage of hypnosis so that these things will take. Also pre-programming so that whatever you come up against uh, in mental or mind control, you're already a pre-programmed and it will take a pretty good sophisticated, which believe me, they're out there that person to crack through that hypnosis, which can help you in allaying pain, which can help you in actually forgetting or remembering the key to locking in where those programs are hidden in that so-called subconscious mind, uh, sleep learning techniques and alpha tapes, which can help you to memorize and pass tests, usually within about 24 hours of study, you can almost quote it word for word, under hypnosis you become what they call again, able to view a whole page. These are the kind of things you just don't teach to people who are not ready for it. And you prove how you're ready for it, not by the so-called training you've had, and I consider most colleges and universities giving you a training program, but by that that you wanted to do to become a new ager, that you chose to get into by looking at things from a different point of view, and by proving it by going through it to say some 36 weeks. Uh, you don't do that unless you have an interest, and that interest makes you worthy and makes us want to help. We're, and I think most of you have now realized when we took that last class in religion, we're faced with a lot of ignorance on this planet, and we're faced with a lot of intelligence on this planet, and we're faced with a lot of wisdom on this planet. The point is we can't seem to combine all three. And those that get one become holier than thou, those that have little need a holy thou, and those that are in between again don't know which way to go. They become the so-called agnostics of space and time. Decisions will have to be made and have already been made by many of you. And as I say again, I only hope that you stay together as a codicil because in the things that happen where one person stands, it's much more difficult to reach that person than where a group of people can notify others by whatever means necessary that something is about to happen or can also support others. Many of you, of course, come from different walks of life, have different kind of jobs and vocations, and if you have one thing in common, you've been exposed to some very interesting, different kinds of teachings. Some of you have told me in private discussions that 
many of the things that you have learned and talked about and thought about for some time before these classes became matrixed or came together in this course. And I'm happy about that because it makes me feel that the course is worth something. Many of you have said that it has opened up new doors and new thoughts and you're now more able to research and not just take everything fascinatingly but can pick and choose and intelligently decide what you would want. Hopefully this will be another piece of the puzzle and a part of the arsenal of hope and intelligence that is yours once you can expand consciousness. The things that I'm going to say tonight will be way out, but most of you are already way out, so you've already passed that point of return, so I don't feel bad in saying to you, nor do I feel hesitant. As in all of the classes that I teach, feel free to challenge openly, feel free to discuss it, and I hope that we can stay here until most of those questions this time are answered, and whether satisfactory enough, as you know, that only comes from within yourself. I can only give you the little limited knowledge that I have, and then you must compare it with the wealth of information that is now your truth. I again suggest that you choose carefully that that you share that kind of information with, because people who have not had the time to evaluate over 36 weeks will find some of the things you say offensive. And I expressly say that people will accept aliens and the alien presence and talk about it, whether it's in ignorance or intelligence, faster than they will a challenge of their religion and their religious dogmas. Whatever you do with it, you've paid for it, it is yours to use, and I can only say, as I hope the Creator blesses me, that the Creator will indeed bless you. We are all going to need that blessing. Let me start by saying that <clears throat> the Earth as we understand it is much older than any of our scientists seemingly are talking about. Suspecting, yes, but they wait for corroboration and approval from their deans and from their heads before they dare venture out because other than that they'll be laughed at or worse than that monies will be taken away from them. That's what locks in a person into a field of conformity and makes us sometimes again unappreciative of the possibilities of what has happened on this earth because to talk about it outside of your peers makes you appear ignorant and most people are afraid of appearing ignorant and of course now that money is so hard to come by they're afraid because of monetary reasons. I can only state that one guesstimation of the length of time of our planet has been around is 356 million years. That does not make it a very new planet. I can say that there are confirmations that our Earth might actually be four and a half billion years old. Four and a half billion years old. With life forms on it. 356 million years ago. That pretty much destroys a concept of a 4,000 year old Adam and Eve that were the first life forms on this planet of intelligence. I think I can safely say that the research you've already done shows that there are voluminous numbers of books and articles about these kind of subjects. It's just that they're not normally in your public libraries and then again some of the libraries and research centers that normally you've gone to as you've gone through the classes and schools that you have gone through. So what I'm going to say tonight can be verified by books. It doesn't make it true. But neither does it make anything you've learned true if the only way you can verify it is by books. You can find a book written by somebody about anything that will somewhat agree with what you're thinking. In the end result, there's only one way you can find truth. And by now, you should know what that is. How is that? You know it then. <clears throat> there's no truth until you decide what truth is. And don't let anybody tell you that there is a truth or this ultimate truth that's been debated. There is no truth until you decide what truth is. The point in being is that when you <clears throat> come into a society that best agrees with your principles, then the truths that they find you can live with much easier than those in the society that you do not agree with their principles. With that in mind, I guess that's enough disclaimer at the beginning. We can now get into the meat of why I had to do all this claiming. And again, the state may the creator bless you and believe what you will. There is no truth until you decide what truth is. Our Earth has got a problem because our Earth is a being. All planets are intelligent consciousnesses expressing themselves in a planetary form. 
they are larger in their karma or dharma than you because they can take on more of you than you can of them. The way to get a lot of units of consciousness, what do I mean by that? People, you, are units of consciousness. To get at one spot is to place them on a planet. So a planet is a larger unit of consciousness than the smaller units of consciousness, which either invade or habitat with it. A unit of consciousness can, again, invade another unit of consciousness. To this planet, many of us are viruses. To this planet, many of us are bacteria. And to this planet, many of us are germs. Also to this planet, many of us are supportive electrons which enable it to be and to exist. On your bodies, you have viruses, bacteria, germs, and supportive electrons. In your mind, you have a unit of consciousness which is attuned to a huge computer which is attuned to a huge matrix, which is attuned to an infinite intelligence, and no one that I know of has yet been able to fathom what that infinite intelligence is. So if you ask me what is the almighty creator, I cannot tell you other than the fact that I believe that such exists. This planet itself, being one of the milli, uh, literally the millions of other planets, is one of maybe zillions of other planets or the zillions of other planets that have life. Life is everywhere in all forms that you can think of. And in fact, you cannot think a thought that does not already exist or have been being thought of by the creator. That is your downfall. You cannot create any new thoughts. And the axiom or metaphor, whichever you would, that there is nothing new under a sun is literal. You cannot hold any new thoughts as long as you have a son, for the son is your step-down transformer or mother that keeps you in the incubator stage until you can again create your own light, become what they call sons of light, daughters of light, children of light, and then you don't need a son. So whenever you see a son, understand you're entering into an ignorant system. Ignorant only because they cannot stand on their own and they need that chakra center to give them balance. So yes the chakra center to give them balance. So, this little molecule that we call our planet is really insignificant in one sense, except that nothing that the Creator has made seemingly is insignificant. And this molecule has undergone a lot of karma. Karma is absolute results of absolute actions, absolutely. It simply means, again, that you get away with nothing. The result of what you do is karmic. The debt of karma is to pay for it from three to seven times over, depending on what system you're in. Dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A, and we'll go to the board later because I've got a lot to put on the board, is that once mentally you can understand what it takes physically or physical actions to bring about, you can set aside six physical actions or six lifetimes because you can mentally project yourself into what could be without having to go through it like a little child physically in order to enjoy or to learn from it. Dharma is mental awakening <clears throat> and physical absolvance. You don't have to go through something physically if mentally you can project yourself into seeing how it would wind up physically anyway. So it's saying again that the higher you go in consciousness, the more mental you become. Physical attributes are on the bottom of the scale. Mental attributes are on the top of the scale because mental can always make physical, but physical cannot make mental. Our planet is physical. There are planets which are non-physical. And beings who are invisible to us exist upon them because they are mental plane planets. Once you absolve into pure energy or pure light, you need no physical planet. Once you have an endoskeleton and a hardcore finish, if you would, you need a physical planet. This is a physical planet. Because of that, it is made up literally of 192 basic elements on the physical plane. Behind any element is energy. Underneath the grid of any element, are protons and electrons and a nucleus. But all protons and electrons and nucleus are simply but first and second stage manifestations of pure energy 
which we call, when it reaches that stage, mind. So literally, we are in a matrix of pure mind by which little whirlpools and eddies interface and something is created, which we call physical. You cannot split an atom down to its infinite source because the infinite source of all atomic structures, whether they be microns or whatever subatomic uh, particle you're talking about, comes into a pure energy state. And our planet, even though it seems solid to us, if it ever would dissolute, becomes something that just is called energy. So that's why when you split an atom or burst a planet or create a meteor or a comet, you are simply releasing the energy matrix that made that thing back to its original cause, pure mind. Everything we've been able to see in the omniverse is either coming from pure mind and going bigger, where size means, again, the further away from the thing you are, or in the process of coming back from its huge size back to the pure energy that started it. At the core of everything is pure mind or pure energy. On this particular atom that we call Earth, there has been created what is called an atom bomb. It releases radioactive particles because it rubs against the grain of the planetary atmosphere. Anything that rubs against gets a charge, and that charge becomes radioactive, and that radioactivity, if it is not again carried down to how it was formed from, simply pollutes or antagonizes the planet itself. So, every time they explode an atom device or atomic device, a lot of positive energy in the form of what we call soil or earth is thrown into the atmosphere, into our sky. Because it is positive, it is attracted to the north pole of our planet, which is negative. Because it is positive in polarity, it's attracted to the north pole of our planet, which is negative. Once it gets up there again, through friction, heat is being created. And as it slows down, as it begins to get near what is called that opening at the poles, to bridge that gap, it either is going to be whisked into our planet and begin to spin around or jumps to the other side of our planet, depending again on the force of entry. But all that friction is causing the area at the polar orifice to melt. Now, there's not as much ice as you would think and snow up there as we would think at the top of our planet. But as this begins to break up, it emits again, it liquefies, and then it forms what is called a magnetic energy. That magnetic energy is then whisked down to the bottom of our planet, to the South Pole, which is positive. And then as it reaches again, oh, about the 7th degree parallel and so forth again, begins to refreeze, which is causing a buildup of ice at one side of our planet and a melting of ice at the top of our planet. If this continues with the rate of what they call the greenhouse effect, which we'll also talk about, which is based on the same thing that's happening here, then within another 15 years, our planet would flip over. I didn't state 15 million years or 15,000 years. At the rate that it's building up, together with other things I'm going to tell you, our planet would flip. If it flips, we're all dead. If we're not dead, then it means we're in the very center of our planet, like a gyroscope, which will not be affected by the outer rotation, or it will have to be someplace else. Each atomic device does that. Now, We've even added to that. What is happening now is that the various volcanoes of Earth, and understand there is no such thing as a dormant volcano. All mountain ranges were once volcanic because all mountain ranges are pus bumps that have been extruded on the surface of the planetary skin. And as you know, once a lesion has been formed, put enough sebaceous oil in there again, it will form again. There is no such thing as a dormant, latent volcano. All mountain ranges can become volcanic, they can erupt, and with enough pressure, will erupt. They are again, literally, the pus bumps of Earth. It shows then, and that's why the fluid within them is so toxic and hot, 
Were you to break a blackhead or a boil worse on your skin, that fluid is both toxic and hot. It can be measured. It can even get a radiation count from it. That's what boils are. This gland where your body is throwing out from its inner precious side to its exterior side the same kind of fluids that our planet is doing. That means that the planet is in, has a problem, it's a disease. And you either help that situation by your vibrations and your mental efforts, or you hinder that situation by your mental efforts and your vibrations. Where groups of negative individuals pump together, they are considered cancerous by the planet. Let me repeat that very clearly because that should answer a lot of questions. Where groups of negative thinking, earth-destroying, polluting, killing type of individuals accumulate, they are considered negative viruses or attacking disease germs or bacteria to the planet itself. And that area then is considered a cancer. Where you have helpful cells, T cells, lymphocytes, immunization cells that are helping to destroy that or to neutralize those cells, you then have a battle going on. The battle now is for our planet Earth to either get over this disease and throw off its cancers or to become so susceptible to it that it will die. If it dies like any other body where vermin live, they either crawl over it until it's destroyed and has no more life forms, or again, in the death throes, it destroys all that is with it. A planet is built the same way we are built. And in fact, all things seem to have parallel matrices. Keep using that word, I'll tell you why soon. Whatever you see in the microcosm, you should probably what? In the, macrocosm. in the macrocosm. Whatever you study in the macrocosm, if there's order to the omniverse, you should also see in the what? Microcosm. The microcosm. So whichever one you want to study, you get the same results. In the teachings of expanded consciousness or in metaphysics again, there are seven universes. Seven universes. Not one, but seven universes. Each universe is divided into 144 sectors, or sections. Each sector is subdivided into 144,000 galaxies. Each galaxy is further divided into 144 million constellations. Each constellation is divided into 12 solar systems. And each solar system is divided into 12 planets. In the book, which most of us seemingly have more exposure to than any other book outside maybe of the Holy Field Horse, the Holy Bible, there are many things in there in which many basic Christians state that there will be 144,000 saved at the end of this time of tribulation and the coming again, or again, let's just say the second coming. A misinterpretation of that Christian Bible gives them that miscalculation, for it is not 144,000 people that will be saved, but 144,000 galaxies that may be saved. That's a big difference, I think. The 144 is a division brought here by people that we refer to now as the Mayans, as they use that kind of linear progression in dealing with astronomy, and many of the people that came after them used. <coughs> understand now that when they're now, you're going to hear that term used more and more, Mayan, it is a mispronunciation. What they're really saying is Olmec. Anytime you study what is called Mayan, Still in Mayan history, Mayan. you're really talking about Olmecs. <coughs> See, I want to use the board all at once, but you're probably right because we're going to cover so much. I'll probably forget to put some of it on the board. I want to give an overview first before we read that into here. You look at the Yes, there's a little piece. <laughs> Yeah. 
Chilean are those so-called South American Indians, quote unquote, that live throughout South America, Brazil, Mexico, wherever it might be again, there's uh, Argentina. Anytime the archaeologists talk about Mayans, they're really talking about Olmecs. And if you have my black history class, you should know all about Olmecs. If you didn't, the Olmec is a negroid looking character that you find throughout South America in those huge monoliths and statues. These are the original people of Earth, the Olmecs. The people before that, we call the Elves, from which we get all some 250 different words in the dictionary that prefix with E-L. Elves were called Elves because they were light benders, and those were the ones that made the goof here when they came to give a planet the seed of life. They were to prepare for a life form of higher intelligence to be bred on this planet. And if you heard that story before in the Earth class, again, they got here. Thank you so much, Ray. And they got caught up in Earth's electromagnetic field, which reversed the polarity, freezing their energies, if you would. Thank you. And creating them into a physical existence. They were pure mental creatures, light bringers, creatures of light, Luciferians. Lucifer means the shining ones, the bringers of light. I know it. Elves, again, are simply called elves because they could bend light, and light is the first precursor from mind once mind emanates. And they brought knowledge from the four corners of the cosmos. And that symbol has been used as L because what is called the cross are simply reversed L's for them. This is a letter L that we call it. If we look at the overall matrix, as a circle, 360 degrees, then each of those becomes a division of that circle or a 90 degree phase, a 90 degree augmented. <clears throat> so if you take that L and put it the other way, then it met from that corner, in one corner, let's just call this one, this is two, then that kind of energy or intelligence from that part of the omniverse was brought in. Then if you take an L, do it this way, another 90 degree angle, and if you take an L and do it this way, another 90 degree angle, it meant that for the four corners of learning possibility, with all of the various schools, and that's what a planet is, time to go to school and learn on, all that information was garnered together in one people, which we refer to now as the elders, the Ls. They brought information from the four corners of the omniverse and still happen to goof on one little insignificant planet they miscalculated. But with that 90 degrees of learning, they came forth with 360 degrees of completion of a circle of information. Each time we go to a different part of our galaxy, or of our universe, we learn a little bit more. And until we make the complete round or cycle, we cannot have complete knowledge. So, even it's been said the gods can do it because to us, they're gods. To us, what they have learned makes us look like an ant trying to understand a person with a 5,000 degree IQ ratio. These symbols then were always used to show what is called the 360 degrees of understanding that the L's brought. And they were called L's simply because that right turn that they were to make is where you can begin the time travel. It is a way of breaking into what is called linear time. Because that is what you call circular time. But that is the symbol that was used. And the alphabet that we now use, the alphabet thing we use now, is with the prefix E-L. E-L always refers to the elders, and as a state, there's some 250 words that start with the E-L in the English American language. After the goof, which has been called after the fall, 
when creatures who were pure mind and energy and could fathom anything and any place they went by their mental energy tuned into the creator's vibration, they could make bodies of anything they wanted. They were light travelers, they were time benders, they were pure energy creatures, you can call them whatever you want. They had no physical bodies. And the first people here, therefore, you cannot find traces of them because there were no physical bodies. They didn't need them. Whatever our planet had, they would take on the manifestations that our planet offered, never forgetting <coughs> they were really pure energy creatures, and they would go on their way, staying for a time if they chose to. But the abomination of fall here was that when the Earth's sun, and understand, any planetary system having a sun shows it is of a lesser value. Because the sun is, as I stated before, a step-up transformer or step-down transformer, a little womb by which the creatures and life forms within can be protected so that radiation can be bent to a form that they can use. That's what a sun actually is, it may, a maintainer, if you would. And in our more advanced thinking now, it is just one of many chakra centers. It is a chakra and not even a major one. For chakras have divisions also. Remember when he gave you the class on chakras, everybody got caught up in that and told you there was some 285 different chakras in the body, but seven main ones. Those are not the only ones. And our son isn't even a minor chakra. So he makes us very proud, doesn't he? he makes us very pompous. But simply something else making up another bigger chakra that is so vast we can't even see it. But we're coming to a time where we'll be able to view it from a different angle, and they say it's the birth of a new sun. Either way, this is a symbol that was used for very expanse, uh, advanced beings, if you would, and a symbol of what is called the L. There is what is called densities that have been set up. And these densities are also circular. These densities we go through, and it takes us about 312,000 years to go from one density to another, and there are 12 densities. The example I want to give on that one, we'll start with something like this. to a density it takes 312,000 years and we learn whatever that density has to offer. Complete density is called a complete cycle if we go through all 12 densities. Each density of course has its own teachings and its own vibrations. The first one is set up in a clockwise rotation, the other counterclockwise rotation. Clockwise, counterclockwise. Clockwise, counterclockwise. Each one emitting either what is called a plus or a minus, a positive or electrical field in which we're in. Now, when the learning stops at the end of 312,000 years, and that's the time that we use now to compare, then we go into what is called another density for a different kind of learning. If one has been a physical type of manifestation where you learn everything physical possible, the other will be mental. If the one was mental, then the next will be, again, say, a spiritual type, and then later on the other will be, say, a more of a causal type. But each one building up based on the predicated learning or the previous learning or what was given before. Between densities, or as one enters into one of the other densities, there is an overlap. <coughs> this is the density. This is the density. There is an overlap there. 
That area there between densities carries frequencies from the one you're going to and frequencies from the one you're leaving. And that's where these frequencies overlap. It is known as an arc. ARC. An arc is an overlapping area separating one thing from another. So the two things arc together. This is what we then refer to as an arc. Within that, until you get deeply into the density you're traveling to, and having left the density you're traveling from, then you are really timeless because you're being caught up in two different kinds of vibration. And it is what is called a very rough time. Because you're getting energies of a magnetic quality intensely on the edge of one density, <coughs> and energies of a very positive or electrical quality <coughs> intensely on the edge of another. And this is where most of the problems come around. This is where a planetary earthquake, if you're going to have it, and cataclysms occur, and so on down the line. We have gone through what are called previously three densities. They have names, it's really not important, something like Gen Plow, Spay, and so on again, like this concrete. Again, these are names based again on what is called Solex Mall, which I explained before is supposed to be a common solar language. We're now supposed to go into what is called the fourth density leaving what is called our third density. And we are presently in what is called the arc of those two densities. We're leaving, again, what is called the Piscean and going to what is called the Aquarium. We're leaving the vibrations that talk, again, of, of balance and fluidity, and we're going into the age of mind and awareness. Therefore, the things that were of mind and awareness were hidden from us because we were more the fish man or the big fisher of man. We were caught up in a time when we swam freely to the fluidity of consciousness. Now we must reach the mental plane, the higher consciousness, and be exposed to, again, those things that govern physical things and how they work. Once we're in between here, there's a little bit of one influence versus a little bit of another influence that are constantly tugging back at us in either direction. And it is a time of confusion, a seeking of balance, a time of tribulation, a time of physical eruption, and a time of mental throwing out things that no longer can stand up on the quest of time. Like a fish in the deep sea, the deep sea of space, once you are hidden with the wealth of fluid knowledge, you even question whether there was air knowledge if there was a higher knowledge. And many of us had to be born at that time in order to experience that so that when we could again be gifted with the teaching of higher consciousness, you would appreciate it. We seldom appreciate that that we don't earn. There's nothing so wonderful as somebody taking the foot off of your head or neck if the foot was never on your head or neck. You can't really enjoy breathing wonderfully until you labor in trying to breathe at all. And many of us have to learn that way. So, concept is again that as we enter into what is now called this new age, this new density, the things that it has to teach are beginning to see through, and the things that we have to give up as children are beginning to be forgotten, and some people don't like it. Some people do not like to put away childish things. And for them, they must stay with that type of teaching because the planet is moving. The planet moves through space as all planets in our solar system move through space and since we are nothing but riders on it, we must also move through space. There's a constant movement effect, if you will. In this age, all energies on our planet, no matter what their vibrations are, must vibrate upward. And we have all kinds of different vibrations. We're told that we have seven continents on our planet. We really don't. We have six continents on our planet. The seventh continent was newly formed and is not a continent at all, even by definitions of what a continent is. And if you would check out what is called a peninsula, you will find that Europe 
is actually a peninsula of Asia. And it's not a separate continent. It was formed in the mines as some races were formed in the mines that never existed other than on paper. Now, what am I saying when I say that? All the continents begin with the letter A. And end with the letter A, except for one. What is the name of that continent? Europe. Europe. Europe, Europe is not its real name. It was never a continent. Again. As I spoke again before, that area used to be called Europa. And you will find a moon spinning around distant Pluto, again, that is called Europa, the moon of Europa, from which many Europeans came. But understand that when we talk about Caucasian, Negroid, and Mongoloid, we're using anthropological terms, which have no basis other than the way that we classify things on this planet. The stories that were told by the Greek, which are now called Greek mythology, are just that. They were stories that these people learned from other people of Earth. And since they didn't understand what they were talking about, they best then interpreted it in their own consciousness, which is called mythology. Most of the history that we now are taught has its most ancient time, the Grecian times. Now, when I say most ancient time, we say ancient intelligence. Well, intelligence is ancient, but the Greeks are not. And when you begin to understand the true history of our planet, you must go past that period of time and understand that things were renamed during that epoch. And they weren't even renamed at the time that we think that they were. Let me give you an example. We're told that at 332 BC, Alexander entered into Egypt, and at that time, conquered and dominated the Egyptians, and set up the dynasties of the Ptolemies, which led, of course, to later on the Grecian Empire, the Roman Empire, Catholicism and the Christian religions. We're giving a date. We'll find again that the people who set up that date, Sir John Henry Breasted and Edgewar Meyer, lied or were ignorant of the two dates. They feasibly got a date from what they call the Khazar and the Khazar empires. But when you read about the Khazar king, you'll find out about how the Jews were invented and that religion. And each time you begin to trace down that history, you'll find that when a people come into dominance, they make the history to suit their beliefs. This has nothing to do with absolute history, which has always been under the teachings of metaphysics and those so-called hidden books. And that's why they took many books out, as we talked about last week, from the so-called teaching books to give people a false kind of concept so that their indoctrination could be complete. Now, if you notice, all schools have scholars, and they have founders and supporters. All you have to do is to find out who supports the system in the main, who their scholars are to find out what the end teaching of that institution will be. It's just that simple. It's not hard to understand that. And understand that most of them are divided then into some kind of a religion experience, and are supported at its base by those that follow that theocracy, theology, or theosophy. Then they have their secret societies, their true hidden teachings, and their advanced degrees are conferred. They go hand in hand with fraternal and sororal, and they go hand in hand with the type of sororal and fraternals that give you the kind of information you need. The information is here that we're dominated by a people who are new to the earth, and who have not taught correctly the history of Earth because they didn't know it until they read about it or were told by their gods, and they told you this, who they were and why they were. We don't understand the term gods. We think we understand the term religion, and therefore, when we begin to see those who give us new history, we usually reject them. So let's deal with it from this point of view then. If there has any kind of validity, what I've just said, or it makes any kind of sense, then we have to go back to see what some of those books have said. The books crossing religion, the more ancient you can get, said that there were gods. That there were people. And that there were gods beyond those gods. And that they fought wars. And they influenced people. 
and they affected people, and they killed and kidnapped people, and they changed people, and they did anything that these mighty gods wanted. They have selectively used the term God, they have selectively used the term Lord, they have selectively used the God term Creator, and they've given names such as Yahweh and Jehovah. They've given all kind of other pronunciations. As we taught last week, we looked at one extensively. And we told you that at that time, everything was combined together, taken from the other world's religions at that time. Well, this is nothing new. What was being said, and what was considered if men on earth, when they came into consciousness, would believe that, that they would follow no political system, and they were right, because they realized there was more in this universe than just what was on this planet. They then had to hide that overall teaching of what people were saying. The people are not crazy. People are not crazy. People begin to make legends of things that they hear over and over again, and which had such an impact that pretty soon it might get distorted, but the basis of the smoke, there's fire. And they take that gods came from the skies. They were different from mortal men. Some of them made it with mortal men. Some of them brought their animals and whatever with them again. And some of them affected man for so much so that man began to evolve and they even took away some of them. All of your religions tell you the same thing. But they put it in forms that don't seem to make sense. Why? Because for a long time we've been told that there's no other life form in the universe. And if it is, it's got to be fractionally. But on this solar system, there is no other life form. Every planet in this solar system has a life form. That's what planets are about. Whether they leave that life form for a while or leave that planet because of reasons or not, at one time the planet was there, at one time life was supposed to be presented up. <coughs> and we don't even know how many planets we have in our system. We have 12. We're told we have nine. At one time we had 13. That's how we'll go about in our second part of tonight's schedule. So, what I'm simply saying is, if we can clear our minds of the fallacies and childlike things that are being destroyed every day, as researchers are now having the veil of Maya lifted, then they're telling you anyway of new discoveries. Remember the one they even now find that the pyramid is, I mean, the Sphinx is older than the pyramid. They're finding now that the coastal areas of Africa and America not only are somewhat alike, but under substrata again, seem to have been maybe worn or rent apart. They're finding again, as they state in the Arctic Ocean, coral reefs, which let you know that one time there was tropical, subtropical areas. Everything we've been told is just about wrong, and this is why they say that there are 360 degrees of learning. But when you reverse and misinterpolate, or when you begin to misteach, then you go backwards in your curve of learning, <coughs> which means that you almost waste a lifetime that usually must hurry up and have to be put right back and this is when, again, the veil is missing. When you understand that what you're being told is wrong, or at least begin to question it, then you reverse and can again come full circle. Here, what I'm going to say, well, I realize what I'm going to say, and I think it has a lot of possible usage. All things that follow the balanced part of creation that is good, positive, likable, holdable to people who are not demented, vibrates in a clockwise direction, whirls or turns in a clockwise direction. Things that are negative, bad, small, destructive, vibrate or turn in a counterclockwise direction bar none. It is a universal law. Things that are in balance vibrate clockwise. Things that are out of balance of phase vibrate counterclockwise. We have whole universes vibrating clockwise. We have whole universes vibrating counterclockwise and that's why more universes can be born because that imbalance brings forth. We need a negative, we need a positive. Diseases in your body vibrate counterclockwise. Positive things that are not diseased or balanced vibrate clockwise. Cancer and AIDS vibrates counterclockwise. The viruses that have been able to be isolated, since we seem to feel that these are things that produce diseases. And we told you before that 
There's no one thing that produces a disease, but yet we're taught that, so to use that as a point of reference, those things vibrate counterclockwise. The cells that follow the matrix in order vibrate clockwise. Destruction or imbalance of either or other simply is to change that vibrational rate and the thing is destroyed. If that's oversimplistic, then nature is very simplistic. Anode cathode ray bombardment, which we call X-rays again, tears against the anode ray tears against the clockwise vibration. The cathode ray tears against the counterclockwise vibration. And that's why we call those pulses or pulses. Everything is pulsing and vibrating, either with a clockwise or a counterclockwise spin. Reverse that spin to change the balance of the thing that has been affecting it or controlling it, whichever way you go. That is your cue for healing diseases or causing diseases, for elevating consciousness or destroying and devolving consciousness. And it's been said that once we understand that, we understand that everything is in a process of becoming or coming from, or evolving or going back to. And that was the ancient symbol that the elves brought with them that they found in many of their crystalline crystal cities and things that they left on Earth and on the other planets which they visited. It is simple as this symbol. This is ancient, that's what we might call intelligent time. Simply means again that let me talk about man evolved, came down from a higher form or place. Wings simply mean it was very light, celestial, so it was centered, right again on earth, must evolve again back to from which he came to again go into the spiral of life and be sucked in to be again projected out into a new dimension, a new consciousness, new understanding. And of course, the following path again is what he followed down it, four dimensions down. We're going into our fourth dimension, our fourth density. As the serpent grows, so will the elongation of time expand. We are going into the fourth one. That's why there are four coils to that one. Man has gone down four times. He can go down seven times. And from this place, he must come up from that fourth dimension back again to where he was. There are other dimensions, but man, as we understand right now, is not in that dimension as long as he's on this particular planet. But this evolving cycle of going and coming is always there. Now, remember we talked about before that under the basic religion, we were afraid of the devil say that that is the personification of evil and so. We say that Eve is the one that bore to man the idea again of his atomic or atomic structure. These are all metaphors that were mistranslated by a ignorant people and later on by very intelligent people who wanted to corrupt the teachings and leave people reversed or new. No, if you look this backwards, devil, it spells what? Live. To have lived and to live in the backward way of ignorance has become the devil. The signification of evil, or Eve, if you will. Evolution. This is why there was always this battle between the evolutionary mind and creature versus the cosmic mind. Again, if you take the same kind of uh, thing again, you find that one man's God is another man's dog. One will follow and serve, the other will serve and follow, whichever you would. There's so many things which we say in this language that are simply reversed that the alphabet simply lets you look at it as though a mirror. It lets you know that there's one way of looking, one extreme, and there's another extreme. What we've been taught in here is what? Anytime you find extremes, 
then you forget the extremes and you seek what? The balance. The third force between that. And that is exactly what a sun represents. It is a force that balances between the extremes. Those are what is called the unseen worlds and those are what is called the seen worlds. Those worlds that are we call planets and those worlds that we don't even know exist because they are on the other spectrum, we cannot see them. We're beginning to see the balancing program of that, what they call it now, the discovery of black holes. But simply there must always be a force that balances between. Let me get back now to some more basics so that what I'm saying, all I'm going to do is to take this into just different levels. It's the same kind of teaching, repeating, just different levels of them. Last week, I also told you just about that the same symbolism was true of what is called the Christ consciousness. Okay? And the crucifixion story, of course, where they say that he was, what did the book say he was crucified in Hebrew? At Golgotha. What does Golgotha mean? Land or place of the skull. So it was. That was one of the old Hebrew terminology. And that was your whole key there. It's crucified. But whether you, one of the other vibrations of this, a lesser vibration, is an actual person crucified between two thieves because he had sunk so low that nobody thought anything more than that, yet he was a life bringer, a person who was more evaluated, what's called the Christ consciousness. Okay, the two thieves, again, as I say, are nothing but those also, in a different teaching, nerves entwine around the spine. I'm not going to repeat all of that again because that's another magical symbol, as they call it. But it's called the Islip and Gala pneumogastric nerves, which give off either electrical or magnetic energy and constantly take energy once it's generated up here in the brain and utilize it. Those have been called the robber barracks or the thieves, if you would, that come in the night and take energy, stopping you from opening consciousness up to medulla stem and expanding into consciousness to what is called the sixth, fifth, and seventh dimension, psychic power, psychic insight. So again, whether you use that or whether you use this, and there's so many other definitions again, the same thing is going on until man breaks the bondage of the light cross. And instead of being crucified and having to live on one of those rays of consciousness, breaks loose, goes to the center of it, and projects out into another universe for more teachings and more understanding. The way we usually understand things is what we call the use of light as the ultimate form of travel. We've been told that light is the fastest speed or rate by which on this planet we can travel, which we can frequentize. The light travels at 186,000 miles a second, and because of this, that is as fast as man on Earth can go. That is not as fast as man even on Earth can go. For to measure light, you must measure light against something. All measurements using the kind of basic quantums that we use are based against the measurement of one thing against another. And even in abstract, like in the new math, you still have to have some basis by which you measure something against it then you can abstractly see by quantities where it might end to. For light to travel at 186,000 miles a second, as was brought out in the sun class as part of review, it means that in many cases, <coughs> they say that solar prominences can shoot out, what, 200, 250,000 miles in a second of time, that is sometimes an element can travel faster than light, which is physically impossible based on what we're talking. Plus, you must measure light against something, which they call, in many cases, the Zeeman effect, when they use sodium. And you begin to find out again on the burning in an electromagnetic field of sodium how fast that thing disintegrates against something, and the fastest speed they can come up with is what they call the speed of light. That is used unnecessarily so on the Earth in a confined laboratory based on, in many cases, helium or oxygen gases. That is not the way you can measure light. What I simply state again is that light doesn't even exist on the metaphysical teachings. Now let's explain and look at another way that light may come into being, which we also talked about in our sun class.
Life is simply the reaction of energy, which in this system is being sent to what is called our sun, when colliding or causing friction with one of the elements of what we call our solar system, and in this case, what is around our planet. When that energy strikes an element, there is a spin reaction in which one goes one way and the other goes the other way, creating a flash, which we call light, and a friction, which we call energy. If we look at the basis of the element, and we look at the basis of energy, we still find what? Mind. It is a flicker in mind. For friction or warmth to be created, something must be lost. I don't want to get too technical with you. And for coldness or magnitude to be created, something must be gained or also lost. So something already was in energy, something already was in what we call elements, and all we're doing is to liberate something of that. What is liberated is called light and heat, what is called electricity and magnetism. And that's all it. Light does not travel. Light is. Oscillations or interaction with that that is called light is what we call the traveling thing. It's simply a ripple effect in something that's already there, which is somebody's mind. Let me look at it from a different point of view. If you have in a confined area something, and there's nothing to measure that something against, you will not know that something is there until they interface. Light is a product of something agitating that something, and that something we say is the energy that comes from our sun. That's why all planets are based upon the sun's polarity and what the sun does. If the sun goes out, all planets die, and the light forms on those planets die. If the sun stays, is different. Now, the teaching behind that says something like this, that our sun is really a little ripple in what is called a vortex or vortex field. Now we've got a new word, or another word that you've heard, now we'll use it differently again. That our planet does not rotate, that our moon does not orbit, and our earth does not orbit the sun on their own volitions. That they are simply caught up in what is called a solar vortex. And everything is caught up with either a planetary vortex, a moon vortex, or other vortexia. The plural vortex is vortexia. That would mean this, that there is something that is spinning, and if we give it another dimension again, in which our Earth is caught up in it, and like a whirlpool being caught down in a sink that you pull the stopper out of, or a tub, we are simply being carried along in a spinning vortex. Now, our Earth has then its own vortex in which it is caught up in and is spinning around it. All planets have their own vortexes <clears throat> in a circular form. And each vortex, depending on the size of the planet, is larger or smaller than another one. Now, if you look at the linear view, we start out again with Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, so so forth. And now let's add Vulcan. And let's add Clarion. These are all spinning in a circular vortex, even though their own vortex is what they're with. So let's continue that vortex. All around what is called a central sun. 
but the sun has a major vortex and therefore all planets are in that overall vortex of the sun and each one spins around in the major sun vortex <coughs> The interactions of those vortexes is what creates what we call light, what creates heat, what creates magnetism, what creates electricity, where they're all the same force slowed down. You cannot get heat without friction. Whether it begins to be thermal heat or whatever, it doesn't even matter. You cannot get light without there coming first what is called magnetism. And again, all I'm saying to you, and looking at a whole different dimensional dimensionality, is that this is what is called a major vortex, and then smaller vortexia that are caught up in this major vortex. That's why things on our Earth spin. That's what is called, what is called a magnetic field. You take little findings, as you know, again, you get your north and south pole, it will still form a circular field, again, depending on how many magnets balance out that field. If you take something uh, in the northern part of the Earth from the equator and you pull a plug, it spins one way. <coughs> you take it in the other part, it spins another way. Because things are sucked down one way and sucked up another way, but it depends on which part of the Earth you're on and how that thing goes down and drain. It's almost like what is called the hourglass. This is the equator. Things here spin down, things here spin the other way. That could not even happen if our planet was solid, which is another way of proving that the Earth is hollow. And the same thing that's happening there is happening inside of our planet. Our planet must take in energy, which can spin around inside of it, or else it would be flung off. If our Earth was solid, ask any of your physicists, and our moon is solid, it would have repelled each other a long time ago. That's why they can't understand how so precariously is our moon balanced that it doesn't fly off and create havoc, or that our own planet doesn't fly up against something else, because they're hollow. And the same kind of a gyroscopic mechanism that works on a gyroscope enables us to walk around inside this vortex and each one interrelate against each other. That's why the kind of pollution that we're creating now by using fossil fuel and then taking off elements of fossil fuel to create heat and so is polluting the planet. Because we have universal energy constantly flowing through everything or nothing could exist. For nature both abhors a vacuum and also a solid. <coughs> they mean anything in physical science, chemistry, or even in quantum consciousness that is solid. Name me a solid. Any solid at all. Proton. Why? Why not? Okay. What do they say about a proton? Matter. It's part of the nucleated mass, is that correct? Mm -hmm. But it's just one, and in order to have the proton, you must have what spinning around? Electron. The electron. So consequently, what do they say? When you free the electron, you make the proton unstable, which means that there must be something in that nucleus that it's acting against. Either the energy, as the quantum physics talk about, from the electron act upon the mass, causing the proton to become unstable. And of course, if you lose the electron, as they say again, you've changed that thing anyway, haven't you? You change it to a different kind of element or a different kind of a thing. Is that right? But when you use the electron, say in so-called when they say they split the atom, okay, then you change the atomic structure of the thing when you lose an electron because it's affecting the nucleated mass. Okay, how could that thing work like that if everything there was a solid? And can you name me any solid proton? In fact, when they split the atom, what did they find? Smaller particles. Subatomic particles. And that goes on till you get down to what we would call pure mind or pure energy. And none of it has a movement on itself. It only has a movement against itself based on what is called the bigger matrix or vortex field. That's all quantum physics are finding out now anyway. Nothing is of itself <coughs> anything except for something first cause that is always there. So infinitesimal, uh, so evanescent, so hard to find that they just call it mind. That's all you can say for a second. 
That supposedly is what the entire macrocosm is based on, the same principles. So what we call vibrations, what we call gravity, what we call electricity, are simply that form of that vortex field measured against the thing that is upon it. Let's go a little bit further with this. Based on that, the speed of light is not a constant. As Planck said, and of course, if you remember again, it was, when you talk about Einstein, he simply used Planck's theory or Planck's constant and began to state. And he stated it again. It was his theory. Jewish people wanted to pontificate Einstein, so they made his theory relatively okay and said that this is a great finding. Plutarch was talking about that. Um, many of the Egyptians were talking about that. And of course, in some of these papers like they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the Qumran Scrolls, they talk about this all the time too. And it's very simple. Man here now makes things very complicated. But things are simplistic. There is in everything mind and intelligence. And how we view that intelligence and how we use it again is what we call our different forces again to use. Based on this again, when people split the atom and create atomic waste, you are then taking all of the electrons away from something, having the nucleus to fall out, and creating then something that is imbalanced, always seeking. In the human body, we call that a free radical. In the solar system, we call it the same thing. Something seeking then to find balance because what was part of it was destroyed, and that planet then becomes a tyrant. That planet then becomes a free radical seeking to connect with another system that is balanced and destroying because it's taking energy from something else without creating energy of its own. That's the same thing we call a bacteria or a virus or a disease. And that's why some systems are balanced and some systems are diseased. In our planet, once we did that, we set off a sound, a resonating in that vortex field that called for balance. The Earth screamed. We can't think of a planet screaming. But when those vibrations start coming out and all those volcanic eruptions start following and sea quakes followed and stuff, there was a call that went out for a policeman or for other degenerate diseases to attack the planet. And that's where your pale horse comes in. That's when the little grays came to Earth. They were viruses. They were imbalanced in their own system. They are the outcast of that system having fought off its natural enemies, having almost killed their planet, and that's when they came again to Earth, because Earth called for either disease or cleansing. And of course, when the call went out for the negative individuals, also the call went out for positive individuals. Now our Earth, once more, is seeing two kinds of consciousnesses coming back. Those gods that are very negative, and those gods that are very positive. I simply use the word God because when you talk about the people from other space and other planets, then we simply say since most of them have more intelligence than we are, then they would be to us gods, or we'd make them gods. Yeah. But the whole point is, some come good in benevolence, some come bad. There is never all good, nor all bad. And especially now when a planet is sick and a cure is being sought. The call went out. The little grays that we hear so much about and they've got movies. In fact, uh, I haven't seen the movie now, but some of the members have told me that this movie, The Lawnmower Man, how many of you have seen that? It's supposedly based on the same kind of thing. Uh, Stephen King spelled it out his way again. Whatever you can create in mind, just about is. These little grays and things came from a planet in the system that is called Orion. It's in the constellation of what is called the Pleiades. It's in what is called the Great Snake Nebula, part of the Milky Way galaxy. They had a problem there a long time ago. Now, we're going to use some years here for whatever it's worth. We'll say 500,000 years ago. In one of the systems, like our solar system with 12 planets, in Orion, there was a planet called Tyrantor. It is from that that we get our word Tyrant. Our word tire, T-Y-R. Our word tyranny, <clears throat> tyrannical. And if you remember again, the 
part of the European branch of people had a Norse god that was called what? Tyre. Solomon, in his wisdom, saw a builder from the land of Tyre. And you get to the metaphors in which they didn't understand what they were talking. But in Tyre, or at Tyre, in the Snake Nebula in Orion again, there were what were called six solar systems that worshipped the planet Tyrantor, simply because they evolved what they call computerization. They were technical geniuses. How long they've been around, I do not know. They progressed to a point where they could make just about anything technical we want. Say, if we would continue with this technical explosion of so-called knowledge and the conglomeration of industries using computers and things like this, and we would do this for 500,000 years, that's the point they had reached. So you know they were pretty magnificent as far as technical understanding would go. They were technical giants, technical gods. They had a body of men that were supposed to keep track of one major computer, and they made one planet into a major computer. A whole planet was made into a computer. You can imagine such a thing. It began then to guide 24 solar systems, and all the way to it got to be 144,000 solar systems were under the guide of one planet one major computer, and then they sought to have little moons made to circle planets in each of these systems to convey the message from the major computer. And people stopped working in that system, in that galaxy. They began to have leisure time, and robotized technology took over for them. The end result of that was that some negative thoughts came in to some of the best scientists on Tyrantor, and they said, look, since everybody in these systems is following whatever this computer on our planet or this planet puts out, then if we could take and program the thoughts of this one, we could begin to control them, and again, everybody would begin to worship us. And so these Pleiadians again got up this great big scheme by which they began then to put out more energy in all to this computer, begin to broadcast through the frequencies of the mind things that they wanted, and pretty soon people were beginning to worship this planet rather than having this planet simply making things easier for them, they begin to worship the people on this planet, and they then call themselves the Creator. Well, as all things do, it led to finally other systems getting this negativity, this cancer that was growing in this part of the Snake Nebula, came there, and a war was fought. That is what the trilogy of Star Wars is based on. If you remember again, it was Lucas and Lucas Films that got some of these old things and said that they were going to create a series, and the last series would come out in 1998. That's when you're supposed to come back with the second set of the trilogy of Star Wars. The people who were peaceful and trying to follow the clockwise vibration were called the people of the Pax, P-A-X. And the people who were against it again were simply called again the ones that were of Sahu, or Gibo, which met again Kessel, the foolish, the Hebrew term for it, or Sahu. Those that were constantly devouring and getting more and more minds and more and more people to follow them and to worship them. That war supposedly still goes on in Orion, in the Pleiades. And the movie that came out, Beetlejuice, was some of the screenwriter's ways of beginning to bring to the people this constant war. Because Beetlejuice was short for Betelgeese. For the big sun now that they orbit around having this fight is called Betelgeese, which is in the Pleiades, outside of the system of Orion. The little greys come from one of these little moonlets in Betelgeese. And since they were already there, negative, they were brought forth by the creator or whatever to this planet here as we begin to destroy it. And that's where a very negative alien life form grew up and was able to come here and exist amongst them. As you read in the book, supposedly a contract was drawn up with them by the United States government. But understand also, 19 other kinds of aliens also came to the United States and Russia and others and tried to also tell them what was happening and that they were at a crossroads. This started all the way back at the turn of the century. And that's why you saw so many spacecraft, and people in Russia said that they saw one kind, and people here said the other kind. All of them were approached by the same peoples, 
Most of the governments made alliances with the ones that best suited their fancy. Only one said that they would give them technology for people or for mines or for energy. And that's the one that's called the Little Grays. Let me state this for whatever it's worth so you at least get some figures. And again, you have to get your own research to believe it or not. The space confederation are called the Galactic Pax, or the Galactic Peace, operates around our solar system and our Earth presently now, and has craft called Ventlas, V-E-N-T-L-A-S, from 51 solar systems, 51 people who can live in peace that are positive and part of what is called the Galactic Pax, consisting of 608 planets, controlling some three and a half million spacecraft. And people say that no spacecraft exists. It's supposed to be at least three and a half million in our solar system or can be brought into our solar system at any given time now. They are from four different galaxies with thriving eons or so of light forms, what we would call intelligent light. There are only six solar systems out of the whole snake nebula in the system of the Pleiades, or Orion, that are bad or negative. And the United States had to choose one of their little moon individuals to make an agreement with. Once you make a pact with the devil, or backward life forms, you're bound to work it out the best you can. And nobody else is going to touch it. The United States invited a cancer and stated since the cancer was very honest and stated, we will give you the technology you want, and that's why you're finding technology speeding up so fast now in both the Soviet Union and the United States. But we want your life. We want your life force. We want your people. And that's when people begin to be abducted by aliens with the government's knowledge, begin to be put into research laboratories down in Belsi, New Mexico, and that's one of the worst places right now on Earth, and begin to invade what is called the Pentagon and other places on Earth and begin to take over, clone, implant the world's leaders. Especially those that have signed an agreement with them because they said, which the United States government didn't know that was their privilege. Because that's the way they live, off of other energy creatures in the universe. That is their existence. That's why they're great. They turn kind of a greenish color when they're full and fed. The old witches of the 15th century, the hook-nosed witches, are simply their ancestors, which were called the hook-nosed grays. Now, they have a name again, Belgicians or so, if you would, but that's what they've been called here. That's what your story again of the witches and who rub around and did bad things to people and so. And, of course, the reason why is because they were invited. Understand that. This government invited them and made an agreement with them. And nobody else is going to touch them because that's what you create in karmic fashion. In dharma, you will change on your own. The reason that there's so much money being spent by our government for supposedly space exploration and supposedly, again, for Star Wars and beam weaponry is because they're now trying to get into a whole different technology on Earth. Now that they've been exposed to just how backward we really are, they're trying to do now what some of these gods from the Pleiades are doing. And this is, of course, why the knowledge explosion is going on. These little greys stated one thing. They wanted everybody on Earth cataloged. They wanted to know how many little units of consciousness were on Earth, and they wanted them to have numbers so that their major computers, and this is what they've always been good at, computerization, on their home planet that is being destroyed daily, daily basis could be cataloged and they know exactly how much energy the Earth had through the people of Earth. Because you see, the people are what gives planets energy. We're told that a planet absorbs energy from the sun. Notice again something in history that you can research. <clears throat> Anytime there's been a major war on Earth, you've had sunspots. Anytime there's been a major decision that people on Earth, masses of people had to go through, you had sunspot activity and perturbations of the sun. Well, the thought is this. The sun does not control people. 
but people control the sun. Chakra centers live off the life force within a system. This is exactly what the sun is doing. When enough negative type thoughts start going there, we affect our sun, which tries to balance out that negativity. And since we jumped and went into a form of technology that was not even part of our solar system, we caused our sun to really go into hyper gear. And now our sun is undergoing some vast changes. Let's take a look now at our sun. In 1959, our sun completed a complete reversal of polarity. One of the last people to note that was Dr. Marshall Stein, University of Chicago, who's now with the University of Colorado, who said too many electrons are bombarding us, too many electrons are coming in upon us, if you will. That is our sun. Our sun is one of 12 other suns that exist in what is called our galaxy. Each of those 12 suns has 12 planets around it. And our sun is being fed by a central sun as are the other 11 suns taking up this galaxy. Our sun reversed polarity and finished the reversal polarity in 1959. The reason why it reversed that polarity because that central sun is part of 12 other suns. make up another sun system. Those suns receive energy from one central sun. That sun, central sun, reversed polarity because it was part of a system of 12 other suns. was fed by a central sun, which reversed polarity, because it was part of a system of 12 other suns, that had a central sun, which reversed polarity, because it was part of a system of 12 other suns which had a central sun which controlled those 12 suns and that system reversed polarity because it was part of a system of 12 other suns and you're getting the message now? Now, in astrology, and it's now a predecessor astronomy, there are names that are given to some of those suns. The names are not really important, but for the want, you have what is called Elcyon and Procyon, uh, or should I say Procyon, and so on and so forth again. If you want some of the names of suns, we can go through them at the break or so, or you can go to any star map. Each of those suns is in balance because they are part of systems of suns. They support planetary life. But there is a life also that lives on suns. Sun life. And on planets near the sun, part of that sun life sometimes becomes physical, 
and there's what are called the inner planets versus the outer planets. Beings that can take that kind of direct sunlight are pretty close to becoming sons of the sun themselves or beginning to be sunlight people. Suns simply take from the central universe matrix, which is called the creator's mind, break down that energy into usable form with the numbers of planets that have been built around it because it acts as their mother or father. It acts as the incubator for them. Taking and stepping down or stepping up that energy as need be for the life forms or units of consciousness that are existed upon. When our sun reversed polarity at 59, it's because a complete reversal of polarity throughout the sun systems was taking place because it was so ordained by some intelligence. And that meant that everything then under a sun had to be changed. That's why it said that there's nothing new under a sun. Because all that energy is simply relayed information previously known and awakened to a planet once the units of consciousness seek balance or evolve enough to be able to take different kinds of information or become part of a different school system. That type of energy we interpret as being cosmic energy. We interpret it as being background radiation. And when an energy field in a system, background radiation reaches a certain level, <clears throat> then the sun changes, flashes out, absorbs the planets within it, which become part of the sun, and new life is then formed. That is what is called a supernova. Anytime you begin to see the intensity of black holes, you know pretty soon a sun system is going to supernova. For black holes are the counter distinction of what are called white suns. And they always appear when there's going to have to be a balance made. In supposedly 1100 years, our sun will supernova. And all planets in this system will cease to exist as planets. They will become suns. To show this, there are energy units being born in the form of what we call people that are part of what is called a great think tank led out by the RAND Corporation that have already sent out toward Jupiter a missile by which they hope, under what they call Alternative 12, they will make Jupiter into another sun. This has already been started. There is a missile on its way to Jupiter now set out by these think tank guys so that they can beat the creator by showing that they're here on Earth having made pacts again with advanced beings and they don't have to wait but they can become a god for this whole system by creating another sun in this system. Now, you, what I'm saying to you, I realize, as I said before, there's no truth. You decide what truth is. But understand what is happening so you understand what's behind these headlines you're seeing. Because of this and with the help of the little greys, they are now being able to go to every planet in our solar system from Earth. The United States and Russia are not going to form a pact and go to the planets. They are already on most of the planets on Earth, I'm sorry, in our system, including Earth. If you remember, in 1960, the Russians were way ahead of the United States in the launching of Cosmos, I'm sorry, Soyuz 3 or something like that. And it was supposed to be a race to the moon. That's what President Kennedy talked about. And then if you remember, all that change, the United States launched, and the United States was the mad person to put the first man on the moon. Well, that's a lie also, as most of the things this government says are lies. But nevertheless, since we love to be manipulated, we bought that. No one questioned what happened to the Russian launch. And then came out the movies like Capricorn 1, which tried to tell you, and so on and so forth again, and then came Gregory, the astronaut, which said that there had been a tragedy in space and the Russians had stopped launching, and the Russians got into metaphysics. And so did John Glenn, and so did uh, many of the other astronauts, they got into metaphysics. They even formed the New York Institute of Metal Physical Science and dropped out. They didn't even live out, you know, they got their little, uh, they didn't even re-enlist in many cases. Some of them were just tenured because, again, but let's not go too far on that. We kind of brought that out in some of the other classes. What I wanted to say simply to you is, if you need corroboration, just go back and find out what we accept so easily and begin to question some of the things that are being made. 
Why was it that the Russians, ahead of the United States in payload capability, suddenly were behind the United States and didn't hear more about their space program? Well, their Soyuz was blasted out of the sky by one of the negative UFOs. Their people were picked up and they photographed it. And this one Russian female cosmonaut hung in space and broadcasted what was happening. And then they already knew, since they had seen the dome buildings and pyramids already on the moon, that there was already life force there. They also again photographed Europa and found pyramids and faces there. They saw on Mars that a whole civilization had been destroyed by something, and the remaining Martians now live inside of the planet, as all intelligent people do especially at this time because the radiation fields change so quickly. That's why our climate changes so quickly, because now there's this ease and imbalance. All planets in this system have life forms, intelligent life forms, either active or dormant. In other words, at one time heavily populated and now lightly populated. And since there are beings who can go from planet to planet in seconds of time, to them to travel within our solar system is easy. <coughs> and they affect the life forms, especially if they're invited to do so. Intelligent, creator-fearing, respecting intelligences from any planet do not interfere with the progress of a people on a planet because they realize if they do, they may be bound to inhabit that planet or to help out until the persons that they've affected are all freed in mind. People who don't care will do anything for power. That's obvious on this planet. The ones that you want to make contact with find it so hard to stay in your vibrational fields that you'd have to get to your highest evolvement and they'd have to get to their lowest point to even meet and recognize each other as beings. The ones who are sometimes even lower in vibration than most of us are the ones that you see. And that's why they call them the imps and the demons that run around in ships and come out and rape women and men and every other darn thing because they have to have some kind of a physical attachment in order to do that. That's where your stories of succubus and incubus come by and the demons come by. And also their little animals that they carry with them and the life forms that they make on the planet because they're masters of DNA and RNA technology. That was what spawned the first need for AIDS. At the research base at Dulce, New Mexico, was where your first aid was spawned by the Little Grays and then picked up by the negative beings, captioned by Eisenhower and all, who commissioned again as they told you that the planet was overrun with too many vibrations. And since you all kill up each other anyway, you would let us have some of them again, per se, and we'll tell you how you can get in control and be rulers of your own planet and world, and we'll recognize you. And then they went out to Fort Dietrich and they began to work on it a little bit more and they told them how to get a replica virus, and they showed them again all the creations of Dulcie that they had made from other planets, crossbreeding everything, and they said, hey, it's possible. So they had a whole new thing, a genetic bomb. Once you make a pact with the devil, who is not an individual, but a collective mind, a mentality against the creator, and even in the book that you hold true to, again, it says that my name is Legion, and my numbers are legion, and we are negative. They already stated what they were. They did not believe in a central creator, and they believed that they were their own individual gods. And that's what our government, and I say that loosely, has made an agreement with. On Earth now, there are about eight different kinds of interplanetary races that can interface with Earth people. And the movies kind of spell out who and what they are. The movies are trying to tell you something. There are the oranges, again, as they're loosely called, that have the spots on the head like lepers, which you found again in Alien Nation and so on like that. You have, again, the grays and the hook-nosed grays. The little grays are so cloned out so they don't even resemble their great ancestors, the hook-nosed grays, which were much taller, and drawings were made of them and carvings were made of them because they influenced people so. You have the Pleiadians, again, uh, the more Caucasian-looking types when they choose to manifest. You have the Syrians, who don't come around much anymore, as they say, who are the more Negroid-looking type. And then you have, of course, the yellows, again, that represent the people from the sun. This is why the Japanese told you that they were sons of the sun, the land of the rising sun, 
of the first seven rays of consciousness. That's why their flag has seven rays. And they were also told, so you have now those that have an affinity for Earth coming back. The difference between is that they will not directly <coughs> interfere. Maybe it's an individual movement, possibly, but not directly, whereas those that don't care will. And that's a problem that we now face amongst many. Saucers that can go intergalactically must use magnetic travel or magnetic lines of force. I say saucers because we're used to hearing saucers. Let's just say spaceships. Or spaceships. <coughs> Craft that operate within a planet's electromagnetic field are not free to travel to other planets. They use electrical lines of force. Those craft that use electrical lines of force have been told how to be built to the United States government by these people from Gatorese. And the United States now has a fleet of flying saucers. Supposedly some 19. There were 17 last year, 19 now. They operate on electrical principles only. They cannot affect the magnetic principle. And the reason why that was not given is because the type of weaponry that these saucers use when they're in an electrical state is magnetic. And for them to fire what they call pulse beams or quantum or quasar beams, much as they use in phasers and Star Wars and Star Trek and all that kind of thing, they have to be able to fire through an electro field. And they didn't teach them how to do that. So they can fly them, but they can't arm them. Therefore, they can be shot down by other interplanetary craft. And that's what the United States is very frustrated about. And this is where they talk, they want to go into beam weaponry research. That's why, not to fight Russia or anything else, but to try and fight off an alien being who has the ability to manipulate magnetic fields within an electrical field, which the United States cannot do because it's against the physics as they have been taught in schools. They don't understand what is called a pulse field. They only understand what is called a circular field, a radiating field. The United States already has a base on Mars with Russia, a base on the moon with Russia, a base on Venus with Russia, and I don't know how much as we speak they're doing because they're working together constantly. The so-called people who were going to announce all of this became the enemies of the United States and Russia and were expendable. And since the CIA manifest again the army line of politicians of our Earth, much as the KGB or Again, uh, so whatever they might be, then this is why they give money to them to give disinformation, to investigate, to uh, irritate, and so on and so forth, anybody who begins to track down and understand and try to report what is really going on. The one world government is because the Greys said that this planet must be under one control, one political system, and they must be at the head using ambassadors to go between our world leaders to control the earth. Now the reason why they're so anxious to do this also is to say because in one line of their heritage they are now cloned out. You can only clone something this so-called life force human seven times. And then the clone no longer can operate. Each time that clone becomes less usable and less viable than its predecessor. And they're just about cloning themselves out their planet no longer will accept them, it's rejecting them. They are disease, they are a disease themselves. And so now they're seeking to perpetuate their life form by bringing in a clone that is part of their life force and part of the Earth life force, what is called the new man of Earth. They want a hybrid. And they can then put their souls or intelligences into that hybrid and take over this planet. Consequently, there are now whole new kinds of races being born and whole new souls are becoming agitated as they try to come upward in the spiral due to the reversal of the sun polarity and that's what they call now a knowledge explosion or consciousness explosion. <coughs> but it's now polluted with negativity because we ask it in. Craft that use electrical fields can touch the earth craft that use electromagnetic fields cannot sit on the earth because it takes a huge amount 
of energy, which they call anti-gravitational pull, to lift off once they touch down. That's why they hover. Those that touch down are generally those that are electrical saucers. It might be the United States government, the Russian government, some of the little gray ships, or some of the ships from inside the Earth itself, the people that live in Shambhala. But electromagnetic craft have a hard time building up the frequency to nullify the planetary gravity field by working with what's called that vortex field. They don't touch down, they hover. And then they usually transmit atoms in and out without touching anything. And that's when people are seen to seem to appear and disappear getting near a craft. The United States has just electrical saucers. Advanced life forms that come from the other galaxies have electromagnetic saucers. They simply refer to them as Vimanas, V-I-M-M-A-N-N-A-S. And the advanced form that the really high pollutant guys that fly around throughout the systems are called avalanches. Doesn't really matter, they're simply craft that they use. The most advanced forms, of course, don't use spaceships at all. They simply tune in in frequency, energize themselves into pure energy, and are there in mind. If their mind wants them to take on a form, they do. And they're using that form to do with it, they leave, and that's it. The ones we have made deals with have bodies, have ships, come from a planet. Why did all of this confusion start in our solar system in the first place? Why was it that we got out of balance in the first place? That's the secret they try to hide from you. By teaching you about races, and by teaching you about a false history, and so on and so forth, and one that I'm going to share with you, again, there's no truth until you decide what truth is. We're talking now of a period of time about 750,000 years ago, when there were 13 planets in our solar system. That itself was a sign that something was going to happen because systems have 12 planets. Anytime there is a 13th planet created, it happens supposedly at a very rarefied time, and it is reason that that particular system where that happens is going to be centered out for something special. That's why the fear of what is called, or triskaidekaphobia, the fear of the number 13. 13 is an imbalanced number which shows that some cause is going to happen. But our planet is said to have had 13 planets. Now one of those planets, of course, was so we say God made, I'm not talking about creator, or let's put it another way, man made, and that's why it was an imbalanced planet. The planet we're going to talk about is called, or was called, Falaria. Well, F-I-L-L-E-R-I-A, I don't know what it is doing control. Valeria was located where we now have our asteroid belt, or that orbit of little asteroids that are now spinning around the gravitational pull of our sun, or as we better can speak now, in a vortex field. Valerians, again, had a, uh, a reach out of technology, and they made what are now called atomic weapons, and hydrogen weapons, and things like this. They began to utilize them, and they fought some small wars with each other, which we're doing on Earth now again, until on one given time, three of those devices of the multi-megaton rates were detonated at the same time, because no one knew that the other was going to do it. Within a period of three hours, three devices were detonated. This caused a break in the electromagnetic field around Polaria caused therefore a destabilization of their inner proton sun. And that sun began to vibrate and oscillate back and forth and Polaria began to build up energy. <coughs> and within three hours time, the system of threes again, Polaria broke its vortex bond, blew its center out, 
exploded its moon, which was called Maldek, M-A-L-D-E-K, and sent its debris hurling throughout the solar system in all directions. Since the inner planets were closer to the sun, the sun began to pick up these, again, heavy electrical atomic particles and draw it toward it. The more magnetic portion of our system is out toward the larger planets. So most of this debris, although flung in all directions, was pulled in toward the little inner planets. And they caused catastrophes within those planets. It caused again on Venus much of the water that surrounded there to be vaporized and then recondensed as a new water formed and set up a huge cloud around Venus. It caused the top of Mars to be sheared off where its water supply was or polar caps and vaporized that almost instantaneously drawing the Martian water heading toward the inner planets of Earth and Mercury and Vulcan. It caused on Earth floods to come about and the waters from Mars and the waters from Polaria and the waters from the moons of Mars, I'm sorry, of Polaria were all brought down here causing great floods in land masses and the earth became more water than land. It caused an imbalance in the planet's mercurial and caused its mercurial climb to be slowed down which affected the sun and huge solar provinces began to shoot out throughout our solar system mutating people on the outer planets. This caused such a catastrophic karma from this one exploded planet and the other planets that all kind of things begin to change. The people of Earth then, of course, had a new water supply, which is called now the ocean waters, which are not the fresh waters that Earth itself created. They had electrons and energies from this and from Mars to then shower down upon it, as did Venus. And later on, we decided, because all of this was done, that since most of the planets now that were still existing and still could maintain any kind of life form had now a interfacing, a karmic tie that those people would be allowed to travel and be incarnate from other planets in that part of our system and they could incarnate now on other planets because the seeds of those planetary life forms were now on Earth anyway. Valeria itself had a huge karma then to pay. And divine intelligences from other galaxies came and restored another planet in Valeria's place. Which meant again that it caused very advanced beings to have to again come into our solar system. And so since they were there anyway, then it was found again that the pragmatic teachings of Earth, since again people like them had come before, messing up our own Earth as they stated, that they might as well again try to have Earth as a settling place to get everything straight. And so to Earth came the most advanced and the most backward beings in about 12 solar systems. And since they didn't believe in death, they had people who were also negative in their thinkings, as all planets have extremes, and Earth began to be almost like a prison colony in which it was said the laggards were brought. Earth has now, amongst its many races, people who have already proven bad behavior experiments on other planets. And they were brought to what is called the Great White Lodges or pyramids that were set up here to teach, to instruct, and to control. So the number 13 was reached and they had 13 different kinds of people then on the surface of Earth living in colonies under direct control and supervision by those who brought them and those who said that they were sending them here by the decree of what is called the Archangels or the very advanced beings who said the Earth could then be used for this case. So we had then brought demented, out of phase individuals to be born here. And then the last karma was that the people from Valeria then had to come and work it out with them for the great crime and abomination that they had made by affecting the planets in our system. <clears throat> and Earth began to be the proving ground for this. Earth is then set up almost as an experimental colony. With every type of vibration, from the inner and outer planets available so that every type of life form could live here. And the worst were brought here. 
once they dissolved themselves of light bodies, they were free to incarnate on what is called the, the earth types. And the only earth type that was thought enough to be able to amalgamate with them was the one that had melanin. And that's the story of Seth. Because that's the only one that could live successfully on the surface of a planet and take all those various kind of radiations. It would destroy any other kind of life form unless it was very dense, very dark, and could radiate backwards through its melanin fields, ultraviolet and attenic rays. And that's why the black body was chosen. Those then that came from many planets began to express in yellow, brown, tan, black forms. And the absence of life forms were the ones that resembled the bloodline of the little grays, for they could not produce well melanin. And this is where you begin to get your various racial types. The thing is, however, that whoever is conscious on Earth and can be born on Earth can come into any of the five racial types for a season for a lifetime, for a time. And the thing that magnetically drew was the thoughts that a person had upon leaving the body or upon death. Which simply meant that if you hated a white person, you'd probably be drawn into a white incarnation the next time. If you hated a black person, you'd probably be drawn into a black incarnation the next time. The yellow person and so, until you had experienced the races of man and understand what it should be to be part of that and understand that all of it was foolishness in the first place because the same thing would carry on would create the same kind of problems that came before by having different kind of thinking patterns no matter what the body existed upon. So on earth there was a chance for everybody to get all of the mess out of their systems under a cell governor or what we now call a planetary leader. So. Because all of this was done, the Earth has become important. And some of the best minds in space and galaxies have come to Earth, some to incarnate, some not to incarnate, because it is stated that if you can get to an Earth existence and come out sane and right with the universe, it's worth up to 10 times the other existences. And that's why many people volunteer to come to Earth and actually incarnate on Earth. And this is why I say they were called the children.